Uh, sir, at Carnegie Mellon University, is very well known for his uh, contributions in parallel algorithm design and uh, programming languages. Um, so he received his PhD from uh, MIT in 1988. Um, he's also recipient of many awards, uh, including an ACM Fellow, uh, the IEEE Charles Babbage Award, as well as the uh, ACM Spa Parallel Computing Award. Um, so today, Guy's going to be telling us about parallelism in dynamic graph algorithms. Okay, thank you. Yeah, feel free to ask questions at any time. Um, so Helen introduced some of the ideas, which is helpful for me. So thank you. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, dynamic graphs and, in particular, how to use uh, parallelism and concurrency. So it follows up on uh, what Helen was talking about. Um, so as you know, everyone in the room knows about dynamic uh, algorithms. Uh, inherently, they uh, tend to be very sequential. You're doing one thing, you're doing one insertion, one update at a time. That's the whole idea. Uh, and so what opportunities are there for parallelism? Uh, to get, uh, you know, get uh, for performance. There's actually two reasons. Uh, uh, so for, um, basically, uh, you know, uh, anyway, so we're going to, I'm going to be talking about two types of, uh, uh, you know, ways of parallelizing dynamic algorithms. The first are batch parallel dynamic algorithms. Uh, Helen introduced this idea. I'll go into more detail. Uh, and, rap and the second is rapid streams of updates and queries. And uh, Helen introduced that a bit too. Uh, I'll go into more detail. Uh, there's actually two advantages to doing batches of operations um, together. So instead of doing one update, doing 100 updates or 1,000 updates. Uh, the first is, of course, parallelism. At least you can get some parallelism from doing the updates. Uh, the second is actually you can actually reduce the work uh, per update. So we'll see several examples that if you do batches of updates uh, or even batches of queries, you can reduce the work over what you would have done is if you did them one at a time. Um, so uh, I'll talk about that, and then we'll go into the uh, streams. So the goals here are, um, you know, basically we want to do these batches of updates to get parallelism. Uh, and of course, there's you know a lot of real world goals here. We might be uh, you know Google or Facebook, and we want to make uh, you know we've got a, maintaining a web graph which might have uh, you know many billions or even a trillion edges, uh, and we've got it's very dynamic, right? So we've got people adding friends, removing friends uh, at a very rapid rate, um, and you know so we'd like to be able to get some you know this could be you know millions per second or even you know. Uh, you know, certainly uh, thousands per seconds of updates, and we do this fast. So that's sort of the motivation for doing uh, parallelizing the, the dynamic updates. Um, there's many different kinds of batches that you might think about doing in, in parallel, many different ways that you could have types of batches, okay? Uh, from sort of the dynamic algorithms work, we know that there's sort of incremental algorithms where we're just doing insertions, uh, there's fully dynamic algorithms where we might be doing insertions and deletions. There's sliding window context where you might be uh, doing arbitrary insertions, but you're only deleting the oldest. Uh, so you've got some window and you're sliding things off the end. Uh, we might have mixes of uh, basically updates and queries, which sequentially, this is just trivial because you just have a few updates and then a few queries. But in parallel, you might say, well, what if I have, you know, a mix, a sequence of updates and queries, you know, maybe I have seven updates, a few queries, and I want to execute all my updates and queries in parallel, okay? And it's tricky because each of the queries has to only see the updates before it, right? So we can't just shift the updates first and then the queries later, right? Because the goal might be that I want to every, we have in, uh, queries interleaved with uh, updates, and we want to have each query only see the updates uh, before it. And so this might seem impossible to do in parallel, uh, but we'll talk about how it actually is possible, and not only that, but uh, there's some specific algorithms to do it. Uh, there's also the case where the data might be uh, kinetic. You might ha actually have moving data, and you want to process uh, these. Uh, you know, we 
you want to keep track of events, you might want to, for example, maintain a convex hull as points move. Um, so uh, we're going to be talking about uh, algorithm in a specific uh, model for parallelism. Uh, I'm going to be giving some bounds for different algorithms. And so when I talk about bounds, I'm going to be talking about two types of bounds. One is work, is the total number of operations. And the second is sort of the depth of the computation. So you can think of parallel computation. You might think of it like a circuit. Uh, and so we care about the total number of operations and the, uh, the depth of the computation. So this is a standard model. Uh, a lot of work in parallel algorithms done at this model nowadays. There's variants of these models. For example, when you're doing parallelism, you might have you imagine just having binary forking um, versus multi-way forking. There's also what kind of memory operations you have. It turns out that these differences really only make a difference in the logarithmic difference in the span and almost never make any difference in the work. Okay, so the model is reasonably robust against across these different variants of the model as long as you're not over-optimizing for the, uh, the depth or the span of the uh, computation. Okay, so, it doesn't, so I guess the bottom line is, you know, uh, don't worry about logarithmic factors in the depth. We've, uh, I've done a bunch of, with my colleagues, have done a bunch of different work, uh, several of these colleagues uh, in the audience. Over, over the last handful of years, uh, I just list here, and I'm gonna go just on a subset. Uh, so we did some, we've done some work on uh, Euler tour trees. Some of you might know about Euler tour trees, and we showed. Um, so what's interesting here is you might know Euler tour trees basically allow links and cuts uh, in logarithmic time per operation. Uh, so here's a case where not only are we reducing the, uh, getting parallelism, but we're also reducing the cost per link of cut, right? Because n log n over k can be less than log n if k is large. For example, let's say k was quick, quick k is the number of updates, number of links of cuts, and it's the size of the data structure. So if this was, for example, square root of, <coughs> well, let's say it was something close to n, let's say n over log n, then this would be uh, less than um, uh, In, As you go on and discuss this, uh, I, am I to think of the inputs again as sequences? Uh, so that the, uh, if, if uh, it's a, I guess. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, so, so the question is, should we think of the, you mean the, the, the updates as sequences, yeah. Right. So in this case, uh, let's think. Uh, let's imagine that they're independent. So I, I'm given a graph. Uh, I'm given a, uh, a let's say it's a, a batch insertion. I'm giving uh, you know some subset of the, the the edges which I know are in there. Okay, and I say, in, uh, sorry, the deletion will be a batch that's in there for the insertion. Be a batch that's not in there, and I'd add them all at once. Okay, so it's it's not a sequence in in, in your sense yet. Um, thanks. Uh, also, there's bat batch par parallel dynamic graph connectivity. Uh, so this is, for example, it's basically it's based on the uh, Holmes. Which, which one's that? Uh, <laughs> uh, algorithm. So it's a parallelization. So it allows for, for their algorithm does basically uh, log squared in uh, time per operation. If I remember correctly. Uh, so, um, for per update, uh, so this again, you can reduce the cost per update if you batch them. So this is basically maintaining graph connectivity with batch updates, um, and it's polylog span, so it's uh, basically you can do a batch of K operations in parallel. Okay. Questions? Um, then there's also parallel, this, this is for, um, uh, more general uh, batch dynamic trees. So as many of you might know, Euler tour trees only sort of allow a subset of all the types of operations you might want on a on a tree. Uh, this just generalizes it to uh, more general trees. What I'm going to be talking about today are actually these two results. One is for batch incremental minimum spanning trees. Okay, so we want to basically add batches of edges to a min-spanning tree. Um, 
in parallel. And, uh, and it, then that in turn has applications to uh, various other uh, algorithms you might want to implement. In particular, it allows you to do the general sort of sliding window, which actually allows you to delete uh, edges in a structured way. And then we'll talk about Perelman cuts, which might not seem like a dynamic algorithms problem, but uh, inside of min cuts, there we make heavy use of dynamic algorithms. And this is actually where we use the sequence of, uh, it turns out you need sequences of updates and queries in most of the min cut algorithms. Uh, and we, uh, so we need to support this. Question. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna start with uh, one of the earliest dynamic graph algorithms. Uh, I don't know if it was the earliest. I, I probably there were other ones before it. But it was Slater and Tarjan's link cut trees. Okay, in the original paper, they had, uh, this is ideas, you maintain a tree, uh, and here it's a weighted tree, uh, and we're allowed to cut edges and link edges as long as we maintain it as a tree. And then we're do, allowed to do various sorts of uh, queries on it. Okay, so I believe in the, in the original link uh, cut trees, they mostly did path queries. So they basically ask, uh, you know, what's the minimum on a path? What's the maximum on a path? I guess you could also do sums of paths, et cetera, uh, you know, at any given time. So the updates are remove and, and delete edges. The queries are uh, give me some property of a path. So uh, these were well, shown how to do these in logarithmic uh, time back in the early 80s. Um, and then they used this, it is very simple, once you have link cut trees, they, they had two example uses of this in the paper. One was for max flow, the other one was for uh, main, you know, incremental min spanning trees. And it's a very simple idea. So once you can make these uh, queries, path queries, it's very easy to do an incremental min spanning tree because what I do is I just add uh, my edge. Okay, so I'm doing incrementing by adding a new edge. It's got a certain weight. And uh, of course, what I wanna do now is remove, look at the cycle that that creates, okay? And remove the max of the cycle. So that just means do a path query between these max, max query on between those two. So, some of you have certainly taught these and this in classes before. So of course now we want to do a batch, right? So this this uh, lecture is about batches, um, and okay. So we want to do a batch now. So instead of having one edge, we're going to have let's say we want to add these three edges. And now you might say, uh, well, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to remove, in parallel, I'm gonna do the same with well, all of them, right? All three of them, I'm gonna find the uh, max on the cycle and remove those, okay? I think you'll convince yourself that that's uh, probably not gonna work. Um, the problem is, The problem is basically two of them are going to find the same uh, same edge, right? Um, and in this case, I guess you know this <coughs> cycle and the other one. Uh, so you're going to basically end up removing the same edge, and you're not going to get a correct graph. Um, so the issue is: so how do we actually add these uh, as a batch? So what you can basically do is you, <coughs> let's, okay, I don't like this click here. Let's not do what I'm doing. Let's do. <coughs> is you're gonna start here, and what you wanna do is you wanna add these edges, okay. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm basically gonna realize that a bunch of this graph is not very helpful in the sense that it's all this stuff hanging off the edge is, is not gonna be very helpful, right? Furthermore, even after I take these things off the edge, I've got these two edges here, and it's probably clear to you that all I care about is the max of these two edges. It's not gonna be the, the, the bottleneck. 
So what I can do is once I've identified those uh, sort of these the the endpoints of all the edges I want to add, okay, I can sort of prune this graph, right? Is I can get rid of the uh, these degree one vertices, okay, or anything that hangs off of the paths, okay, and then I can also compress uh, paths which don't have any of the red vertices on them. So now, uh, let's say I've compressed this graph to, to what's left here. Uh, you can probably convince yourself there's only going to be basically at most a linear number. In fact, there's going to be fewer of these black nodes than there are of the red nodes after I've compressed this, right? Um, so at this point, I can add uh, the green edges. These are the ones I'm think, considering adding. Some of them I might keep, some I might not, right? Um, so at this point, how can someone suggest a way for me to uh, update the min spanning tree? Create a new, create a new right. On this graph, I can com uh, compute a new min spanning tree, okay, which would be that one, which basically says I want to keep the eight and the five, uh, but I'm not going to keep the six, right? <clears throat> And so I compute this new spanning tree, min spanning tree, and uh, that tells me which ones I want to keep. And it also tells me which ones I want to delete, right? Because it tells me basically that I'm going to delete the six and the 10 out of here. And so that's the, basically the, the algorithm, the idea of the algorithm. So we can add a batch. Now doing that sequentially, you could probably come up with your own ways of doing this sequentially reasonably efficiently. Of course, we have to do this in parallel, okay? So the interesting part here, there's actually two interesting parts we need to do in parallel. One is we actually have to do that, remember we did that compression part of it, where we have to basically prune off all the unimportant parts of the uh, tree. The other part is we have to update the uh, tree itself, right? So we have to add the edge five, eight and five, and we have to remove the edge 10 and six, okay? I'm not going to, uh, well, I'll, I'll briefly explain how to do the, uh, uh, the updates. Okay, that's the updating. we basically going to keep a dynamic tree of some kind, like a link cut tree. And we're going to allow it to do batch links and cuts. So we're going to do a batch link. We're going to add those two and then a batch cut. Okay, um, removing those two. Um, but we also want to be able to do this contraction. So let's go into how to do that. And the idea is actually comes from something called a rate compressed tree, which dates back to the uh, mid 80s. It was actually work in parallel algorithms. And it was a, a technique for taking a tree of arbitrary tr shape and contracting it down into a single node uh, in a lot of the logarithmic number of rounds. And this can be applied to, for example, evaluating expression trees, a lot of operations on trees can be done, or even finding, uh, you know, maximum uh, weights on paths, et cetera. And it's a very simple algorithm, is you basically repeat uh, uh, two steps, and these are done in parallel. So what you first do in one step is you find all the degree one vertices, and you rake them off, okay? So you just pull them off. So we identify the degree one, and that's what we're left with. And then we alternate that with another round which finds a independent set of degree two vertices, okay? And we compress those out, okay? So here we've identified, there's actually various choices we could have picked, we could have picked C and I. But what's important here is that the, uh, uh, the H and D are independent, right? And so now we compress those out, we identify them, and we compress them out. Uh, it's not hard to convince yourself that after logarithmic rounds of rakes and compresses, you're left with a single vertex. Uh, uh, you could, uh, to pick the, pick the independent set here, you could do it by random, uh, so-called random mate, is everyone flips a head and tail. And if you're ahead and your neighbors are uh, tails, then you, you pick yourself and you pick a con basically a constant fraction of the, uh, in expectation of the nodes would be picked. Uh, so as long as you pick a constant, you know, uh, some, it doesn't even have to be a maximal independent set. It just has to be within a constant factor of a maximal independent set, which is pretty easy. Any questions about this? So anyway, this 
leads, so first of all, it gives an easy way to paralyze uh, uh, contracting this tree. But if you actually keep track of what, what's done during the contraction, it actually, what it's basically doing is building a balanced tree on top of an unbalanced tree. Right. Is what you're doing is, uh, so these are basically representing sort of a clustering. So we first basically do in one step, we do all these things. So these are the rakes and you know compress, right? And then at the next level, we do an another set of rakes and compress. And it basically builds you a hierarchy. Okay, it builds you sort of a flat, uh, you know, a balanced tree on top of a uh, unbalanced tree. Okay. And for those of you who are familiar with things like top trees, this is similar to top trees, although it, you know, it wasn't, this wasn't uh, uh, originally designed for dynamic trees, although uh, it actually has some advantages for dynamic trees in the sense that it's easily, it's well known how to paralyze this. Miguel, of course, knows top trees. Um, and so, um, anyway, you get this balanced tree on top of an unbalanced tree. And so let's look at how this might help us do the... Um, <laughs> well, I should m mention that to do updates, remember, we want to do links and cuts on this batch links and cuts. So we want to remove a bunch of edges. It turns out, and I'm not going to describe how this works, but uh, you can do these on this tree. Basically, you can do a bat batch of links or batch of cups, cuts by basically updating this tree. Okay. I'm going to look at the, this compression, which is this idea we want to uh, sort of, if I give you some set of endpoints here, I want to get rid of everything that's unimportant, right? So in this case, I'm certainly going to want to get rid of these pieces of the graph, okay? And I want to do that work efficiently in the sense I want to do that in somehow that work that's close to the number of points I'm adding. So in particular, it's going to be within a logarithmic factor. Okay. So, well, how do we do that? Well, if I have in this tree my endpoints, J, K, and, and uh, C, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, basically go up the tree to the root. Okay. And I'm going to mark all from, from those three nodes, everything on the way to the root. Okay. Uh, there's actually going to be k times log n over k max of those. Right. Uh, and so uh, that's how many nodes I'm going to have to visit. Okay. So now what I do is everything that's not on that path, I just throw away. Okay. So in particular, I only have to look at children of nodes I visited. So this is this work, throwing these away is proportional to uh, the number of uh, orange nodes there. Okay. And that throws everything that disappeared here, right? There was something here and here and here which disappeared. Okay. And there's one other step is I also would like to do some contraction along here. Well, it turns out to remove the B and the C, all you have to do is look at the nodes which only have one yellow child. The B and the C, okay, and you can throw away uh, uh, the, the vertex that's associated with that. Okay, so in this case, I can throw away the, I guess it's the B, yeah, I'm going to throw away the B, and then I can do the same, uh, I guess this node here only has one active child, and so I can throw away the E, and I'm le left with exactly what I want. Okay, so this does work. That's uh, proportion to the number of yellow nodes here, which is at most uh, k, which k is the three here, is the number of vertices I'm compressing that I want to keep uh, uh, times log n over k. Because that's as, the, as many, the most answers as you can have, assuming this is some sort of balanced tree here. So that gives you a way to basically compress this tree in. Uh, you know, work efficiently in uh, k log n over k, total depth uh, of sort of uh, log n. You just have to propagate up the tree. Question? Where, uh, can you remind again, where did the n over k again come from? This here? Yeah. Uh, this is if you, in a tree, what happens, assuming that it's, there's a, it's, it not only has to be log n height, but that it has to basically be shrinking at a constant factor at each level. Then the, it just this is a general property of balanced trees is the number, if you give me any uh, k leaves of a balanced tree, 
the number of ancestors is the most, and uh, basically k log n over k. Because what happens is that they meet as they come up the tree, and then you're going to be double counting. Forgive me for not knowing this, like is spanning tree verification known to be linear time and log depth, or is that? Oh, spanning tree, min spanning tree, you mean, or? Uh, verification. Yeah. Oh, verification. Well, you can do min spanning tree and randomized linear work, yeah. So that's well, so <coughs> the same bounds as hold for sequential also held in parallel, right? I guess I was thinking just for deterministic. But I guess oh, like no, deterministic, no, that's not, no. I, by the way, the algorithms I'm describing here are, are randomized, I should point that out. Okay. I see. Log n over k. Um, okay. For the reason you just said. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wait, what? What? You want to get if you're willing to do randomized algorithms, there are oh, linear sure. works. So it's not crazy. Well, I don't know. I guess I guess at some point the dynamic lower bounds are <clears throat> So I don't I don't know what you should hope for. Yeah. I'm asking what you should hope for. Okay, so yeah. I remember the K here is not, we're talking K is not, is the number of updates, not the number, the size of the graph, right? Yeah. Now, whether this is optimal or not, I don't know. That's, that's a good question, if that's what you're asking. Whether you can get rid of the, whether you can get rid of the log. Whether you can get rid of the log. To, you know, honestly, I, I think it's going to be difficult, but, uh, you know, I'd love to talk to you about it. If you like. <laughs> um, you might hit some hard cell for the log bounds. Mm. Uh, I would have to think more deeply. Yeah, that's what I was whispering. I know it kicks in at some point. But I mean, that's really some crazy stuff you. that goes on uh, in even simpler things. You can have a discussion maybe with incremental my incremental connectivity. <laughs> you. Okay. And well, if maybe Sorry. because this is being recorded, maybe if you want to have a conversation, take the mic because other people would want to hear it. I might want to think twice before. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I'll just repeat, I'll repeat what, uh, what, what he said as, as far as I understood is that there might be some cell complexity lower bounds that make this impossible. The range of log n divided by log log n. You know, cell probe, you know, you, this is sort of like point the base type algorithm. Say you're not going to do better than log n, but if you start using the power of the RAM, then you can do only a little bit better. Okay. So there might be lower bounds. So I haven't looked at the lower bounds, but yeah. Um, so anyway, this gives, just to summarize the whole algorithm. Uh, so if you want to update a batch of uh, uh, edges, which now it's an incremental algorithm, so an update basically means just add a batch of edges. Um, what we do is we uh, uh, we uh, basically we've uh, have this dynamic tree. We maintain this RC tree. Okay. So at the beginning of the step, we have an RC tree for a tree. Okay. We, as I just showed, we do this uh, uh, pruning to shrink it down to size uh, k. Okay. And that took k, uh, you know, these bounds here, k log n over k. Um, then we compute the MST on the compressed graph. Okay, and this can be done randomized in uh, uh, in k time. Although I guess we've got more time here. This is, I guess, what the question was: is could we actually prove this? There's two parts of the cost. So this one can be done in k time. Uh, this one is, you know, as far as I know, this is the best you can do. Um, and then uh, now we've got now we know which edges are new edges and which edges we have to remove. So anything that was in the tree that's not, not in the min spanning tree we have to toss. Anything that's been added that we keep of the new, among the new edges we insert. So that's just a batch uh, insertion and batch deletion to the tree. I didn't show you how to do that, but you'll have to believe that works. Any questions about that? Okay, so that's the uh, uh, basically idea of how to do a batch. So it's an example of how you would do a batch incremental algorithm okay, in parallel. Uh, then this in turn has applications to uh, the sliding window uh, context. And this is, some of you might have seen this idea of a sliding window, is what you have is you maintain sort of uh, two fingers. And so you're basically maintaining some set of uh, the current edges, okay? And then you can insert new edges. And so let's, uh, and now we're gonna do a batch insertion of new edges. So I'm gonna suddenly insert some set of new edges, okay? And then I can also expire new edges. So 
so I can shift it over. Now, this is not a, a fully dynamic algorithm because I can't expire any edge. I can only expire edges off the end of the time. Right? Uh, so uh, with, you know, with our incremental MST, it actually turns out to be uh, not very hard to implement uh, this sliding window algorithm, not for MSTs, but for simpler problems, in particular for connectivity, case certificates, by partners, cycle freeness, uh, et cetera. And the basic idea is if you just think about it for connectivity, is you in basically encode the weights as time, right? And so a shift over time basically just means uh, uh, you're going to ignore any edges which have, uh, uh, you know, weight below some certain edge. So you just delete those edges and the min spanning tree will maintain connectivity. Okay. And you can do similar sorts of tricks with these other prop problems. So it's very easy to do uh, sighting window. Now I mentioned that it's also possible to do connectivity in the fully dynamic setting. Okay. But if you remember that was sort of log squared n. This is only log, sort of log n, you know, modulo the n over k. Uh, furthermore, it's very much simpler than the, uh, not to complain about your, your algorithm, but it's, it's not the simplest algorithm in the world, right? <laughs> Before you leave this slide, you know, what kind of sparsification are you talking about here? I'll be honest, I can't remember if this was a couple years ago. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we can talk about that. Questions? Okay, now I want to talk about the, the batch. This is somehow more perplexing that that's, this is even possible, is the idea of uh, mixed batches of updates and queries. Okay. So let's say I have, uh, you know, these are the sorts of uh, uh, query. I've got two types of queries and two types of updates. Okay. It turns out that these are the sorts of queries and updates which are needed in many uh, of the min cut, most efficient min cut algorithms. So the n log squared n uh, type min cut algorithms. Um, so oh, oh, basically, right, we might want to uh, basically do a query where we're asking for the, uh, the minimum on a uh, path or the minimum, you know, a sum of a path, or the minimum or sum of a subtree, right? So we can identify a subtree by just identifying the root of the subtree and maybe the direction it, it points, and we just want to might want the sum of that subtree or the min min edge weight on that subtree, and likewise for a path, we just identify two vertices and what the you know, max of the path or sum of the path. And the updates are similar. They, you know, we can update the weight on a path. So I can give you two endpoints, and I say add seven to everything on that path. Right, or I can take a, a subtree and say add seven to everything on that subtree. So these are, let's say we want to support a, 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 a dynamic data structure that supports these. Uh, in the sequential world, it's well known how to do this using uh, you know, pop trees, RC trees, uh, link uh, cut trees. The original ones weren't designed for subtrees, but you can actually even modify those so they work for, for subtree uh, operations. Uh, but now what we want is we have a sequence of these, and they're mix of these updates and, and uh, uh, queries, and we want every query to answer relative to just what was in front of it. Okay. But we want to do that batch in parallel. Okay, so that's, that's the goal. Turns out that this is a, important in many, like I say, uh, uh, min-cut algorithms, these sorts of operations, and they do get applied sequentially. You, do, you basically go through your edges and you add add sort of some weight between the two endpoints and then you do some query and then you do a few more updates, a few more queries, and they're just interleaved in that. Right. It's offline, so I know I know the sequence ahead of time. So that's a good thanks for answering. So I know the sequence of queries and updates. Okay, I can calculate that ahead of time. Okay. But I have to answer each query relative to only uh, what's happened before and not what's happened after. Um, so it turns out that as long as you have your, your operations satisfy 
Uh, so what we show is a, some restrictions. So it turns out it, it's not fully general. Okay. Uh, as long as your operation satisfies this simple operation restriction, okay, which basically says uh, it's based on the notion of an RC tree, although I guess we could, I'm surely, generalize this to top trees as well, is what you do is you, as long as you store um, value, basically, we can answer queries, okay, and make updates under these following rules. That basically each node of that tree, you know, I showed you that RC tree, that balanced tree that we put on top of the unbalanced tree, as long as you can basically store uh, some values, you know, on each node, and for updates, what you do is you can always just update the value of a leaf and propagate it up to the root, okay, and then update the values, you know, so you think of each, maybe the node is a sum of everything below it, right? Uh, and as long as the queries basically only have to traverse from the leaf uh, up to the root, okay? So every node in our original tree, uh, you know, uh, corresponds to a node in that, uh, that balance tree that we, we built on. So it turns out that uh, most uh, of the standard queries and, you know, like subtree queries and path queries, you can implement in this way. Okay. And then we show that basically, uh, if you give me an arbitrary sequence of updates and queries of this flavor, I can answer them in parallel in uh, sort of work efficiently. So these would be log n operations. By the way, here I've lost the over k here. So I can no longer do this in the over k. So now it's actually k log n. Um, work, so that's the, the, you know, if I ran it sequentially, that would be the sequential time. And this matches, so it's work efficient. This is how long it would take sequentially. Uh, and uh, a polylog span. So I can do this in parallel. And uh, order K, you know, extra memory beyond the memory for the trees, et cetera. Question about the standards, what's happening? Okay. I'm not going to uh, <coughs> go into details how this works, but basically the idea, I'm just going to give you sort of a, a high level idea, is what you do is you put your operations at the leaves, and they each have a timestamp in the sequence, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, okay. And then you go up from the leaves. Do I have a picture of this? No, I don't. You go up from the leaves and you basically merge the timestamps as you go up. So each internal node will have a sequence that's uh, as long as it's, as its uh, number of, uh, you know, its subtree size, okay? Sorted by timestamp, okay? And then what you can do is sort of like so-called prefix sums where everyone can calculate everything that happened before it. So you know, from the point of view of the updates, you know uh, what happened before you. And then the queries basically know which of those locations to look at, the time. So you know, a query at, at time 27 will go look at the updates at time 26 and everything that happened before it. And that's the result of the prefix sums. Okay. And so uh, you basically propagate this up. It's going to be k log n work because the total number, these lists get bigger as you, as you go up. So the root's going to end up with a list of size k, right? a sequence of size k. And in fact, the total weight of each level is k, right? It's a bunch of its singletons at the bottom and then you know pairs at the next level, et cetera. And so the total uh, work here is uh, k log n. Okay. So basically, you propagate up this information, OK? You could do that just for the updates. You could propagate it up and down, and then you can have the queries then go and figure out which they're, they're correct. Uh, in reality, what you do is you do all the updates and queries together. All the queries look at uh, basically the prefix sum of everything before it uh, and calculates the output. Any questions about that? OK, so it turns out that uh, you can use this as a uh, sub-step in a, in a bunch of different uh, algorithms. Uh, in particular, we used it in, in to uh, reduce uh, min cuts. Uh, so th there was a recent uh, result which basically uh, reduced uh, uh, 
you know, pre until about three years ago, the best that was known was m log cubed n for min cuts. It was improved to log m log squared n in the sequential context. And we showed that basically using this approach, we can get m log squared n in the parallel context uh, with only uh, you know, log, poly log uh, depth. Okay. We actually used this idea in two different places. Um, and I don't want to go into details of uh, min cut algorithms. One is in parallelizing the so-called uh, two respecting cuts. Okay. Uh, and getting that down to m log n time. And it turns out you need log n of these steps. So it's going to be m log squared n time. And the other is actually in a, uh, a Kaga, it turns out a subset of Kaga's original, you know, m log cubed n algorithm is an approximate uh, min span, uh, minimum cut algorithm, which is some of you might have taught in, in, in your know, algorithms courses. It's where you pick. Uh, basically, you know, the, the min randomly pick weights and then uh, contract the tree until it's a, a singleton. Um, and it turns out that you can use the same idea of batch uh, updates and queries uh, to implement, uh, implement that efficiently. Any questions? Okay, so that what I've been talking about so far is basically, uh, you know, batch uh, uh, dynamic algorithms, right? We went through a batch incremental min spanning tree. Uh, as I mentioned, there's several other ones. Um, and then we, there's two reasons that you want to do batch uh, dynamic algorithms. One is you actually got a situation where you're getting batches of updates. Uh, and the other is as a sub-step in another algorithm, okay? Uh, in fact, I was very interested when I found out that, you know, a lot of the new ideas in MaxFlow uh, have uh, dynamic algorithms in them. And I was wondering if I could apply the uh, batch uh, dynamic algorithms uh, to them. But apparently there's other parts of the algorithms which make them very sequential. So it seems unlikely that we can apply these, at least for now, ideas to make heavy use of, of dynamic trees and uh, sequences of uh, updates and queries. OK, so my next part is basically uh, uh, related but different work. So here the context is we have, uh, in fact, this is someone asked, well, what's the difference between batch updates and uh, batch dynamic algorithms and concurrent algorithms? OK, so this is almost the first part was in batch dynamic algorithms. We have a graph, we're getting batches of updates and batches of queries. Uh, and in this one, we, it's much more of an asynchronous set, setting. So this is sort of a, uh, what's often called a concurrent setting. So we don't have synchronous batches, okay? We have a situation where we might have this very rapid update stream, right? So these are individual updates. So this is just add a single edge, add a, you know, delete a single edge, et cetera, okay? And then what we're trying to do is we might want to then look at this graph and do various analysis on it. So it, it's not really a dynamic algorithm instead of I'm not actually maintaining a MST. But what I want to do is I want to look at this graph and I want to calculate the MST. I want to calculate the, some clustering. I want to do some, you know, query this graph. Some of the queries might be cheap. They might be, that, does this edge exist? You know, what the neighbors of this vertex are? Some might be expensive, like, I don't know, find the traveling salesman a solution to this graph. Okay. But the point is that I, each of these algorithms have to see a static view of the graph, right? They can't see the graph as it's changing. And these queries are sort of interleaved, as I've drawn them here, uh, you know, in some arbitrary ways. You know, someone comes in and says, oh, I want to do a, uh, I don't know, min spanning tree. Here, I just want to look at the neighbors of some vertex. I want to do all sorts of things with them. And, that, and I want to answer them quickly. And not only, so I can't basically wait until some other query finishes. Okay. And then I also have a rapid set of updates. And again, they can't wait uh, until, uh, you know, some, some query could take, let's say I'm doing the TSP, it could, could take three days. Okay, I'm not going to hold off on my updates until that TSP is finished. Not only that, but by the time the TSP is finished, there's going to be another query. So there's never a free time. Of, of not doing work. So this is the old days back in databases where 
they'd shut down the database from midnight till three in the morning and they'd run the updates. Okay, that's not the world we're in. We want to actually have it running continuously. Okay. So the question is, how do you do this? And it should be clear to you that the problem here is the consistency. Is I can't, this algorithm that's running here can't deal with a graph that's changing over time. Okay. This, this is, uh, you know, we don't want to make the user, make the algorithms robust against changing updates. It would be a nightmare to have to do that. So each of those queries has to see a static view of the graph. So the question is how to do this. And the cool thing is it's, you know, before I showed you back the data structure ideas back from the 1982, I've moved a few years in advance, I'm now into 86. Okay, we're gonna use what are called persistent data structures. How many of you remember these? Or <laughs> I can see it's the older crowd. <laughs> so anyone that was educated in the uh, 80s and maybe 90s know, knows about uh, persistent and data structures. They're actually a really cool idea. They originally appeared in a paper by Driscoll, Sarnoxide, and Tarjan. Here we got Slater, Tarjan showing up again. Um, and it's this idea that you basically, you keep a history of uh, the uh, values of a location. So normally when you write to a location, the old value disappears, okay? And what we do is instead we keep a history. So if we write B and we change it from D to F, we basically, we change it from D to F, but we keep sort of a linked list of what the value looked like over the time. Okay. And, uh, it turns out that this is, uh, was actually very useful, and, and uh, uh, Sarnak and Taj in the same year showed how you could actually use this in a lot of uh, cool uh, sort of computational uh, geometry data structures, one of which was in, in point location. So point location is you're given a bunch of, uh, given a bunch of lines, and you're given a point, and you want to find the line below it, or, you know, actually, you can turn this and trap, break this into trapezoids and then uh, find the trapezoids in. It's equivalent, but let's, let's just think of the variant where for every point, the query is, tell me the line below it, okay? And the, uh, you know, and we're given a, a set of lines, okay? And he showed, uh, uh, Sarnak and Sarjan showed for the first time how to do this using these persistent data structures uh, using n log n's construction time, uh, log n per query, and uh, linear space. And it used the idea of persistent data structures. And the idea is uh, there's this class of algorithms you might have heard of, of sweep line algorithms. You basically sweep from left to right. Whenever you get to a left endpoint, you insert it into a tree. You, sort, you maintain a tree sorted by the y coordinate. You sweep along the x coordinate. This is an insert, and all the green lines here at the beginning are insertions, all the red lines are deletions. And then what you do is if you keep a history of what this tree looked like across all these operations, then a query is just, you go to the right tree here and then just look it up and that's it. Okay. So once you've got the persistent data structure, this becomes easy. Okay. So well, what does this have to do with uh, you know, our problem at hand? Before I do that, let's look at something a little bit more interesting, which is a rotation. Okay, so this is just a standard rotation. I'm switching D and F is coming, F is coming down, D is going up. And this is, it's gonna make three changes to the tree, tree because it's basically B is now gonna to point to D and D and F are both gonna change their children. Okay. And so this is what the persistent data structure would look like for that. By the way, does anyone understand how we're maintaining linked lists? Okay. So we're um, now, <coughs> let's get back to, uh, you know, streams, queries, and updates. So our goals here, uh, one is to linearize, uh, you know, up basically the sequence. And so linearize is a technical term in the concurrency community, which basically, it has to look like it happened in a sequential order. Okay. And in the particular sequential order, we're going to go, if we go back to our position here, the sequential order it's going to appear to happen in is everyone's going to appear to have all the queries, the updates happen in the order they happen, okay? And all the queries are going to linearize at their start. Okay. 
And maybe you were already figuring out how we're going to use persistence here, which is we're going to somehow uh, use the, we're going to basically look at the version of the data structure which was valid at that point of time. And that the graph and the algorithm is always going to look at that uh, version in time. So that's the basic idea. Uh, we want a few other uh, 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 things. We want the constant overhead for updates. So when we're making these uh, updates, you know, we're doing a rotation that should take constant time. Okay. Uh, this is actually without contention. So I'm assuming that, say, no one else is making an update on that same node at the same time. We want it to be constant. If there is, uh, these are going to be what's called lock-free in the sense that one person will win and the next person will have to wait. Okay, so one person will get it done in constant time. Anyone that's contending might take a bit longer. Okay, queries are wait-free. Again, this is a technical term, which means uh, even if a process is, any other processor stops, they're going to continue and succeed. And this precludes the use of locks. In fact, even lock-freeness up here, we cannot use locks if we want to support these. So we have to do it without locks. Um, and another thing we'd like to avoid, it turns out something that's in inefficient about uh, persistent data structures is every time you read a pointer, you go indirectly through one of these links, even if you're looking at the most recent version. Uh, and so, uh, <coughs> so anyway, so uh, we would like to avoid this and have somehow be directly go to D. And that's, a, that's purely a, a practical reason, not a theoretical reason. So the main ideas here is, uh, you know, sorry, so we, we basically it's going to use persistent data structures. You know, how do we make them safe for concurrency? And there's two two main ideas here. One is uh, uh, what we're going to do is use uh, uh, copying and timestamp helping. And I, I'm only going to have time to very briefly talk about the uh, the idea of uh, partial copying here. And the issue is, getting back to here, is in the case of the rotation, we had to make three changes. And we want to make it look atomic. Remember, we have to make it look like these updates are happening one at a time, okay, atomically. We can't, in other words, we couldn't first, you know, change, you know, B's value, then F's value, and then D's value, because someone that came in would then see an inconsistent view. Okay. Um, so again, that's in this context, they all have to see a consistent view of the graph. Um, so the idea is uh, actually very simple, although there's uh, details which I'm gonna, I'm gonna wave over, uh, is you basically copy DNF here. So instead of mutating DNF, you create a copy of this. And in general, if you're doing a larger change, let's say a change that involved you know, four or five nodes, like a double rotation, then you'd have to copy everything that's changing except for the one thing that's sort of at the root of the change. Okay. Okay. At this point, now when I'm doing an update here, I can just update the uh, uh, single B is the only thing that changes, right? This still points, now I have two versions of D. I've got D and D prime. So these are my two new ver vertices, but I made a single update. Okay, this is the data structure. Um, the next optimization is once you do this copying, uh, it turns out you no longer need the level of indirection. It's, this is not true in general. Uh, I'll give you an example. If you didn't do the copying, okay, you can actually have B point directly to D prime, which points to F. So what we're doing now is we're sort of adding to each node the meta information that we need to maintain this list, which is basically a next pointer and a timestamp, right? Because what we have to do at each of these, you know, it should be clear that each of these nodes, we basically keep a timestamp so that when a query comes in, it says, you know, after time seven, it looked like this, before time seven, it looked like this, right? And so each of these nodes in the linked list has basically a next pointer, a value, and a timestamp. And so we can just merge those into the, in this case, the tree nodes. Okay, so this red arrow here is basically a timestamp and a, uh, the next pointer. Okay. And the reason it's not obvious that this is <laughs> correct, and it wouldn't be correct if we didn't do the copying, is that now what we have is two nodes which both point to E here, 
and they only have one version list. Well, before F prime had a version list and D, D had a version list, and they're very different over time. So it looks like, well, we can't share this version list here. Okay. But because of the copying, this is actually safe because this path, we will never traverse this path okay, at a time earlier than the earliest thing in this version list. So even though this is sharing the version list, if you come down this path, you will never traverse that version list. And so therefore it's safe to do the, uh, uh, to have them both point here, even though this is the incorrect version list for F prime. In fact, F prime just was exist, just created at this time. There's no way that the prior version list of this is correct for F prime. So that's the basic idea. Uh, I've only showed a uh, subset a set of the steps, um, but you can. There's a few more steps to make this work in a way that's safe for concurrency. There's setting. It turns out the most tricky part is actually setting the timestamps properly. Okay, and um, uh, so there's some tricks to do that. But once you do all this, then you get the uh, the goals that we wanted, which was a, a concurrent updates. Uh, safe concurrent updates and uh, uh, you know in constant time uh, constant time updates and wait free queries. Okay. In fact, the time for a query is, if you think about it, right, is you have to if you're querying something at the most recent time, it's going to be the same as it was in the original data structure, right? Log n. If you're going back in time, it's going to be the number of edges you traverse, you know, per per lookup here. And you can show that the copying actually helps this, right? Because when you copy, you're sort of breaking up long chains. Okay, so it has the, the added, added advantages. Okay, I'm going to skip a couple things because uh, I'm just about up. Is that correct? Or? Okay. Um, so <clears throat> there's uh, sort of some open problems. In fact, there's many open problems. I think are just the three that came to mind this morning. Um, so in this, uh, the streaming update model, uh, the, uh, the, the operations we're doing on the graph are actually standard static algorithms, right? We're running like min spanning tree on the graph and we're more concerned about how to maintain them properly as we're doing updates. And so they see a consistent view. You could imagine a, a com combination I mean, in, in, in the, in the, uh, Batch dynamic, we're doing a batch of insertions, a batch of queries, a batch of you know deletions, a batch of queries. What if you wanted to do batch di dynamic algorithms, but allow the queries to happen in the middle? So now I'm doing a batch insertion, like in the in the case of the min spanning tree, and in the middle of that batch insertion, I want to do a bunch of queries. I want to figure out what the min spanning tree was, or or maybe other uh, queries on the graph. Um, so there's uh, many questions here. Um, for those of you who are well familiar with the slater Tarjan, et cetera, uh, persistent data structures that you might rec notice I missed over a fine point, which is this idea of node splitting, uh, which guarantees worst case bounds. Uh, exactly how to do this in the concurrent setting is still open. And this is something that uh, maybe I put it down this morning, but after Helen's talk, you know, some of this has been uh, looked at already is how do you make these data structures more efficient for caches and uh, IO? Okay, so that's all I have. Some conclusions, uh, basically that you know, batched algorithms not only help by allowing parallelism, they can actually reduce the work, like in the case of the uh, batch, you know, links and cuts, um, and can be used to interleave updates and queries. Uh, and that this, this concurrent setting can be basically used to do, so we're going to get snapshots or consistent snapshots so the queries can up operate while updates are happening. Okay. Okay, well, if you have any, uh, you can talk to Guy after this. Uh, so we have a reception now uh, from 4 to 5 p.m. And then tomorrow we'll be reconvening at 9 a.m. for the uh, coffee and check in at 9 30 for the talk. Yeah.